given a grand round this morning on an update on cardiac surgery here at uh, UC Davis. So, Dr. Farmer, say a few words of introduction. Yeah, I just want to take a minute to um, bring to everybody's attention that may not have how much uh, amazing progress has happened in our cardiothoracic division over the last decade, really, and uh, so much of it is a credit to uh, great leadership all around. The division has evolved into you know, three special, three separate sections, each with their own leaders, and has gone, has developed an integrated residency program, as well as achieved some of the highest outcomes in the UC system, developed a great um, program in mechanical heart failure, and is on the brink of developing a heart transplant program here at UC Davis. So I just wanted to embarrass Dr. Young a little bit before I let him get started and uh, thank him for his leadership over the years in this uh, great program. So, Dr. Young, turn it to you. Well, thanks. Actually, you gave my talk. <laughs> so, so, anyway. All right. Well, well thanks, um, uh, Dr. Former, um, uh, for inviting us to provide an update <clears throat> uh, of our service. Um, I thought what we'd do is uh, spend a little bit of time um, giving you a little bit of a retrospective uh, and um, also um, uh, s just sort of uh, fashion the gestalt for you uh, and then we'll, we'll talk about uh, where we are uh, in the church of the what's happening now, as Flip Wilson used to say. Um, so um, this is Charity Hospital in New Orleans um, and um, I went to medical school here. Uh, LSU's on the right side, Tulane's on the left side, and we shared the entire hospital. This hospital uh, had 2,600 beds um, and uh, was the second largest uh, hospital in the country next to Cook County. It also had the second largest trauma program uh, in the country uh, next to Cook County. Um, and, um, you know, it takes up about a city block in, in New Orleans, and, and you might wonder, well, how can you get 2,600 patients in it? And the reason is, is because um, just like in the, one of the historic photos of the place, we used to have open wards of 10, 15 people in one room, uh, no curtains, no nothing. Um, Charity Hospital was established in the 1700s uh, uh, for care for the poor. So uh, as I was growing up in Louisiana, uh, only poor people uh, went to Charity Hospital. Um, they were all treated for free. Uh, when my grandfather needed cataract surgery and when he needed his prostate surgery, my mom drove him there and dropped him off and then went and picked him up several days later and there was no charge and that's what happened. The attendings were all private practitioners from New Orleans. Uh, the residents and the med students ran the place and um, and the attendings came in and made rounds and went to the OR and the residents did all the cases, the interns and the students took care. We did all of our own lab work. Okay, we drew the bloods, we did our own CBCs, we did our own chem panels, not too fancy, often incorrect. Um, <laughs> all, our own, all our own cross matching and, and everything. So um, th thing, things change, but um, uh, the, 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 the real point of this slide uh, was to show you that our uh, intensive care unit, which was a new unit, was called coronary care unit for patients with myocardial infarction, really looked just like this. There were 15 beds in the room and a few out in the hall, and that was routine on at midnights, which for each med school was every other night. Uh, there were not enough beds, so we just put the patients on gurneys in the halls. So they were lined up in the halls, and maybe they had oxygen, maybe they didn't. But all the patients with myocardial infarctions were in an open ward just like this. They had a monitor on, that was a new big deal, uh, and they had oxygen. And if they had a myocardial infarction, the treatment was a big debate as to whether they were going to get morphine or aminophilin or Lasix. That was it. Okay. And so, bottom line, if they had a big myocardial infarction, they died. If they didn't, they survived. And uh, what we did didn't have much to do with it. 
and the care certainly wasn't very intensive, especially when I was on call. <laughs> um, this is the uh, surgical amphitheater in Charity Hospital. This is what it looked like after Hurricane Katrina in 2005 when the hospital got flooded and the place got condemned. Um, I used to sit like right there, okay? Um, and I saw my first autopsy here. Uh, they just wheeled the cadaver in and cut them right open. We had 130 medical students, and I can tell you several of them started throwing up right here, <laughs> right in the room. A couple fainted, I and mean, this is not a joke. And um, we, we didn't have Game of Thrones back then, right? I mean, we, we, weren't, we weren't used to seeing people cut open. Um, and we, we had a couple of cats in medical school that we, you know, cut open, but they didn't bleed. Um, and, and, and so to see a, a, a recently deceased person just split wide open, all the organs taken out and weighed and everything it was, it was quite the sight. You'll notice there's no audiovisual equipment. There's a blackboard. We had grand rounds here every Saturday night. I mean Saturday night, um, channeling. Um, every Saturday morning uh, when you're on the surgery service. And importantly, that, that was tough to get through those grand rounds. They were all case presentations. Uh, again, no audiovisual. There was just constant grilling. The residents sat in the front row. Uh, this is across the street from Charity Hospital. This is Larry and Katz. You can see there's some stacks of boxes in the back. They were ostensibly a wholesale liquor warehouse. So that let them sell liquor at a discount. So you could walk across the street after Friday evening after being, you know, taking tests all week in med school and for 25 cents get a double shot of bourbon. Okay. So for a dollar, <laughs> a dollar, a dollar, you could finish off your week pretty strong here. <laughs> and Larry and Katz across the street. And then what I did is I wanted to live in the French Quarter, so I had to drive a taxi cab to augment my uh, income. Um, and so th this all happened on a weekend, and then Saturday morning you had to show up here for Grand Rounds. But quite the historic place, and Alton Oshner and Mike DeBakey would come in there and uh, for total Houston days, but it was pretty exciting stuff. Anyway, thoracic surgery, as a specialty is known in those days at Charity Hospital, was not very refined. Um, this is a book review from 1907. I don't know if you can see this very well, but it's a book review by Claude Beck uh, <clears throat> on uh, thoracic surgery. The bottom line is it was mostly, um, it was mostly dealing with uh, pus. And really at Charity Hospital in the late 60s when I was there, um, there had been progress made in pulmonary resections, uh, particularly after World War II, but by and large the thoracic surgery was, uh, service was draining pus and treating pneumothorax. There was an occasional pulmonary resection and about once a week somebody would try to do a heart procedure uh, with a heart lung machine and, and it didn't work very well. Uh, it, it just didn't work very well. Uh, so, uh, the, you know, the books really up until that time had a little bit about pulmonary resection, uh, but very little about cardiac surgery. Contrast that, if you will, uh, to uh, some of our more recent text, obviously. This is a text uh, edited by Dr. Cook uh, and co-workers, and you can see all the obvious different uh, areas of, of interest and uh, expertise that have evolved over just the last uh, 50 years, uh, and particularly in cardiac surgery. Uh, you know, we even have texts like Dr. Roshi's and Dr. Raff's on just chest wall defects in babies and uh, one written by one of our uh, fellow residents on uh, minimally invasive surgery. So a lot has happened in the last 50 years uh, since I've been involved with this stuff. But this was a big game changer, okay? Remember we just showed you that ward, open ward, all the cardiacs, all the uh, myocardial infarction patients were sitting on that ward just getting some oxygen and maybe some morphine. And then in 1969, even though there had been some isolated case reports, the Cleveland Clinic published an article with over 100 uh, 
consecutive coronary artery bypass procedures with a mortality rate of only like 5 or 6%, and that changed the whole world. Okay, that changed the whole world because up until that time, there was no effective treatment for ischemic heart disease, and all of a sudden, there was an operation that not only was um, successful, but it could be done with relatively straightforward applications that already existed. It's just vascular surgery on the heart. So people already knew how to do vascular anastomosis, you just had to downsize it. And the heart-lung machine was evolving, so even though there wasn't a lot being done with it, when the potential for this operation came, things just exploded and um, led to basically where we are today. Uh, now, if you look at a map of the United States, these are the number of programs per state reporting to the STS database. This is about 90% of the programs in the country. About 10% go unreported. Uh, but uh, you can see California's got like a, over 100. Texas has over 100. And they're just a plethora of cardiac surgery programs. This became not only a big therapeutic intervention where none existed, it became the cash cow for most hospitals back in the 70s. Okay. And that's the reality of it. I mean, the, the CEOs jumped on this and threw millions of dollars in every institution because they were making money hands over fist. This was before DRGs, before anything else. Um, you know, a coronary bypass operation net the hospital about 50 grand back in 1970. So it was a huge financial boom as well, as a big therapeutic thing. And then all of a sudden, after being kings of the hill for about, oh, decade and a half, coronary intervention uh, reared its uh, head, and, uh, and all of a sudden doom and gloom spread throughout the land um, <laughs> um, at multiple levels. Uh, this is going back to just before I came here, actually, uh, in the late 90s, uh, where California alone had 30,000 coronary bypass procedures done. Okay just a couple of thousand of everything else, a few thousand of everything else. And then as angioplasty became more prominent and when the stents hit in the early 2000, in the late, very late 90s and early 2000, drug eluding stents came aboard in 2001, there was another surge of, of PCI, up to 60,000 cases in California a year. And you can see what happened to coronary bypass. It just started, it, it went down and now it's flattened out. Uh, it's flattened out, and uh, last year, the last couple of years, has actually been an uptick. But interestingly, a PCI is actually starting to trail down as well. It probably has to do with the statins uh, and and everything else. Um, but still, th this is a lot of surgery. Uh, and then, as you can see, the amount of valve surgery is starting to increase because the population is aging. Everybody and his cousin has an echocardiographic machine in their clinic, and they're picking up a lot of disease that we didn't even know existed. I mean, it happens every week. We see patients in the clinic that came in for something else. Somebody did an echo on them as a screening tool and finds uh, cardiac pathology that's pretty significant. So actually, if you add all these things over here, you almost come out to about right here. So, so things are, are still pretty, pretty good. Um, you know, the chief of cardiology here uh, gave a lecture when, I, like the first week I was here, to some uh, community physicians saying that cardiac surgeons were dinosaurs. Um, I, I had a, a preemptive warning of, of that talk because I guess he'd given it somewhere before. But um, my point was that dinosaurs. Uh, I had to give a talk on the same, uh, uh, the same, uh, to the same group just after his. But my point was dinosaurs were around for a long time. I mean, they were around for 160 million years. Now, that's pretty successful. So I, I don't know that I, you know, I'm not so sure that being called a dinosaur is all that negative. Now, now granted, the evolution goes in this, in this direction. We probably started out more like about here, and we're kind of more like about here now. We're a lot more, you know, humble and placid, and maybe just, uh, more easygoing than we were back at back in the day uh, when we were the only team in town. But um, 
I, I think the, 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 the good news for our specialty is that cardiovascular disease is still the number one cause of death on the planet. In fact, if you look at the recent data, it's 31% of all global deaths. So one out of every three persons that dies, dies of cardiovascular disease. That's just a built-in cushion for many, many years to come. Certainly longer than anybody who's in this room uh, career is going to last. So we may not be around as long as the dinosaurs, but we're going to be around for a good long time. Uh, there are obviously a lot of different forms of cardiovascular disease, not just, uh, not just um, uh, coronary disease. And again, because of the echocardiographic dominance now, uh, prevalence now, we're seeing a lot of uh, valvular disease uh, therapies uh, come on and on. Uh, also, a big part of our specialty is uh, malignancy in the chest, and lung cancer is uh, the number one cancer and the number one cancer killer in the world. So our thoracic surgery colleagues are, are very busy and will obviously continue to be uh, for some time. So, uh, and then finally, um, congenital heart disease is the number one birth defect, really, of, of of heavy medical significance, the number one congenital defect is heart disease. So there's still a lot of, uh, of uh, congenital heart disease uh, worldwide. It's about 1% of the live births has a congenital heart defect. So you can see that uh, there's just a lot of opportunity here for thoracic surgeons, cardiothoracic surgeons to uh, have gainful employment. Okay, well, so much for background and stall. Um, let's talk about our service here for a little while. Uh, this is the volume curves for, um, for uh, our service uh, over the last decade and a half. The past several years we've done about a little over a thousand cases a year between our three sections uh, and the vast majority of those are open operations. Um, we uh, enjoy the opportunity to still do a lot of big operations. Um, we, uh, we have, as Dr. Farmer mentioned, uh, division has divided into three uh, sections, uh, and our general thoracic colleagues actually uh, do quite a bit of their operations uh, on a minimally invasive basis, but uh, the cardiac surgeons are, are, are still uh, doing most of their cases open. So whether you like uh, big time old fashioned operations or uh, like this guy, you want to do some minimally invasive stuff, um, you know, that's, that's uh, there as well. Uh, looking at each one of the sections uh, specifically, uh, our congenital uh, service is uh, run by Dr. Raff and, uh, and Dr. Rom. And they have uh, their um, nursing assistants, Barb Goble, Mary Zambini, and Mary Sigmarella. And, um, you know, uh, they do some beautiful uh, procedures. There's about 26 different kind of congenital heart defects. And um, having had the opportunity to be involved with this discipline for over a decade, at one point in my career, um, I can tell you it's fascinating surgery. And there's probably no more elegant an operation or more satisfying an operation in cardiothoracic surgery, in my mind, than an arterial switch operation in a newborn. Uh, you take a baby who's got a totally lethal situation, but is often otherwise completely fine, and you do this uh, fancy operation where you um, translocate some tiny coronary arteries and the great vessels, and the next thing you know, um, the babies acting like they're, nothing ever happened to them. And um, the success rate with this has been tremendous. 90% of these kids are doing well up for a long time. But obviously a big, uh, big variety of procedures, uh, total anomalous veins, uh, obstructive lesions on both sides of the heart, tetralogy of flow is still uh, a very common operation. Uh, we don't see too much of this anymore, big atrial septal defects. Most of those are closed now in the catheter base. But, uh, but oops, got ahead of myself here. But um, we still see uh, an occasional one. 
And then, of course, uh, Dr. Rath and Dr. Rom, along with uh, colleagues here, have gotten really um, uh, a well-developed service in, um, in uh, chest wall deformities, and uh, you saw their book earlier. I think importantly for the audience to understand is that the adult patients with congenital heart disease now outnumber the number of patients born with congenital heart disease every year. There are more patients out there who've been treated surgically for congenital heart disease than are born every year. So I think Gary had a 73-year-old patient he did last year. Did you put that patient in the PDICU, Gary? I think he did, <laughs> which was kind of flabbergasting to me, but he got away with it. Um, our general thoracic uh, colleagues, uh, Dr. Cook and Dr. Brown and Dr. David, uh, supported by John Ancona and Sarah Holmes, the physician assistants, <clears throat> uh, do their own share of big operations. The, the most recent twist on that is this multi-specialty esophageal reconstruction team. Look at eight people on this thing. You even got Dr. Anderson and Dr. Pugh there. And uh, I mean, that's a big operation to have eight people on it. I don't know where, where everybody fits. So that I think our residents in the background, I think that's Sabrina there in the background. But, but uh, this is an example of a big operation with multiple specialties that uh, uses, uh, you know, jejunal inter supercharged jejunal interposition grass for esophageal reconstruction. That is a very fancy big operation. Uh, and um, I think it's going to continue to allow us to be leaders regionally uh, in Northern California in both uh, pulmonary and uh, esophageal resective surgery. The, our general thoracic uh, colleagues, of course, do a lot of their operations, probably more than half of them, using uh, minimally invasive techniques, VAT specifically, and also uh, increasingly with the robot, uh, a lot of their uh, more uh, localized tumors, particularly things like mediastinal tumors uh, and thymic tumors, allow themselves very readily to uh, robotic approaches. Uh, they uh, also operate on chest wall tumors, and those end up being pretty big wax as well. So still, even though the majority of their operations are uh, minimally invasive, uh, there's still uh, a lot of uh, large operations being done. I would be uh, remiss if uh, I didn't add on to the clinical aspect of this. Uh, Dr. Cook's just totally outstanding uh, involvement at a societal and academic level uh, for our program, for the institution, and for our societies uh, regionally and nationally. So uh, we're very grateful to Dr. Cook for his uh, involvement at all those levels, and it's a big plus. Uh, for this institution uh, and uh, also for our residents as well. Um, let's see. And then lastly, uh, clinically, our adult uh, cardiac surgery faculty, uh, Dr. Boyd, Dr. Perry, Dr. Rodriguez, uh, and yours truly. Uh, basically, all of our operations are, are, are big operations. Uh, coronary bypasses. Uh, as an isolated entity is a minority of cases now, but the majority of the cases we do have a coronary bypass associated with them. Why? Because if they need a valve or they need an aneurysm or whatever, they get coronary angiograms to rule out coronary disease, and guess what? They often find it anyway. So there's concomitant coronary disease, so even though we're doing a valve, uh, we often add a cabbage in because we find incidental significant stenosis. Um, as we mentioned, the amount of valvular, I'm sorry, I keep um, getting loose on the trigger here. Uh, the amount of valvular pathology that we're seeing uh, is increasing. We see a lot of infectious problems. Uh, here's a tri infected tricuspid valve. We don't have a week go by, I don't think anymore, where we don't have a case of infective endocarditis that we're managing. The operative leads are big operations, a lot of pus in the, in the annuli that often need major reconstruction of the heart. Um, we also are seeing a bit more rheumatic disease because of uh, immigrant population, uh, but also uh, primarily we're seeing um, patients with degenerative valve disease. And of course the big, uh, <coughs> big dog on the scene recently for that 
is transcatheter applications. Dr. Board has been particularly involved with that, running all around the globe, putting, uh, putting transcatheter and transapical valves in both the aortic and mitral position. Uh, there were, I think, about 150 of these done here at UC Davis last year. We have a surgeon on every one of these cases, and so the surgeons are intimately involved. That's all fine and good to put all these valves in. The problem is they don't last forever. You can put a mechanical valve in that 95% of them will last, but a um, but, uh, patient has to be on warfarin their whole life, and most patients don't want that. So 90, 90 to 95% of the valves we put in are bioprosthetic valves. That's like a pair of shoes, okay? It's leather. It's just tanned valve tissue from an animal, just like a pair of shoes. They wear out, okay? It's a little bit better than a pair of shoes, but not a lot. So these things wear out. Uh, there are catheter interventions available to re-replace them, but surgery is often, uh, often required to we replace these uh, these valves. Um, aortic surgery. Uh, we've had a, a, a robust aortic surgery program here for uh, over a decade now, and that is expanding with Dr. Rodriguez's presence on the scene. Um, and uh, we anticipate that uh, with Dr. Rodriguez and working along with our uh, vascular colleagues, we're going to be able to grow this product line very substantially. Uh, Dr. Perry is our only uh, resident that we've trained, that we've hired over the last decade and a half, and he has uh, really been instrumental in uh, refining our ventricular assist device program, um, and uh, and hopefully uh, we're going to be pushing on to uh, solid organ transplantation in the chest. We also see a fair amount of pericardial disease here because of the trauma service, because of previous uh, operations, and obviously there's an infectious component, but we end up, we end up having our, quite a few operations on the pericardium on a yearly basis. We're supported very uh, steadfastly by a pretty solid cadre here of uh, physicians, assistants, and nurse practitioners, um, and um, you all often see them uh, as much as you see the rest of us because they're out there, uh, they're the glue that holds the service together uh, on a daily basis. Um, we uh, we uh, have uh, a very strong group of uh, cardiothoracic surgery residents. Uh, speaking of uh, dinosaurs, here's Sterling uh, here. <laughs> Sterling is our last traditional resident. Uh, uh, and Sabrina's going to be our, our chief next year and be the first of our uh, integrated six-year uh, programs, and Sterling's getting ready to be a local competitor, I'm quite sure, because he's done a great job. But um, we, uh, we very much enjoy working with these uh, residents, and uh, they uh, manage the service, basically. And so I guess in a way they're kind of our bosses, but I know they don't feel like it. Uh, we, we've had some pretty outstanding success with our clinical programs. Uh, in the last year, we've gotten uh, substantially positive rankings uh, from the media. But let's face it, I mean, this is just not about the operation and the operation's immediate outcome. It's about processes, right? So it has to do with the uh, level of nursing care and the fact that we have a magnet program. The fact that we have ICU coverage, the fact that we have multidisciplinary involvement at, at, at a whole lot of levels. So um, it, it feels uh, fine and good to see your name in the lights, but really it's a, it's a team effort and an institutional effort that allows us to achieve these outcomes. Research-wise, uh, we have a whole bunch of things going on in each of our sections. Our adult cardiac surgical um, uh, research involves mainly, uh, currently, uh, Dr. Boyd's efforts with his uh, transcatheter and minimally invasive valve techniques, and we also send tissues for atrial fibrillation uh, uh, molecular mechanism evaluations at the Genomic Center on campus, and that's been an ongoing project for 15 years now. Uh, Pediatrics, uh, our congenital service does uh, pulmonary hypertension models working in collaboration with UCSF uh, along with other studies. 
and then we have a whole host of uh, outcomes um, uh, studies being done by our uh, general thoracic colleagues. So I'm going to skip over in the interest of time this uh, UC uh, collaborative stuff. This is just about um, our uh, UC collaboration with the other services, but I think in the interest of time we'll skip that today. Just to wrap up, um, initiatives uh, on the uh, horizon. We're in the process of developing a mature lung cancer screening program. Uh, we have a congenital data collaborative that we expect to come online uh, next year after a substantial amount of uh, effort and angst. Uh, as mentioned, we have uh, an aortic center that we're trying to put together and we've established a clinic for that that is uh, up and running. And then our big, uh, I think our big uh, ticket item for next year, hopefully, is going to be uh, cardiac transplantation. This is from last week's Time magazine, uh, just heart transplants by the number. Uh, these, there are 4,000 people on the national waiting list. Uh, they have to wait almost a year before they get a heart, by and large. And kind of interestingly, the 3,000 heart transplants being done in the United States now, that's up from 2,000 just a decade, decade and a half ago. So uh, things continue to move and continue to expand, and uh, and we hope to uh, be be in that uh, in that group. So, um, so November is almost over, but don't forget it's Lung Cancer Awareness Month. And uh, thank you very much for your attention. Well, Nihilus, uh, first of all, I apologize for not standing up for your uh, great presentation, but just uh, really do appreciate the, that amazing perspective of how much has changed in a relatively short period of time, the time of one's professional career, which I think is a reminder to all of us that surgery continues to be an ever-changing field and that the, as I saw firsthand in the Galapagos, the people who survive are the ones who are willing to adapt and are best able to adapt to change. So I think your uh, sort of walk through the history of this is really important for a variety of reasons. I'd like to say, I'd like to ask you a question before we open it up to the group. Um, what would you say was the most, uh, if you look back on what is now a really long career in this, what, what's been the most um, meaningful part of it for you? And the most fun. Yeah. Well, <laughs> Jim Goodnight asked me that when he interviewed me 15 years ago. And quite frankly, I like being a hero. That's what, that's what turns me on. You operate on patients who are very sick and um, really are not going to live very long and you get a chance to fix them at least for couple of decades and they're very grateful the family's very grateful the operations are extremely interesting and uh, that's that's what I'm missing for now having said that uh, I spent the first half of my career in private practice it was very very different from this setting um, and um, and private practice was where it was at in cardiac surgery in California uh, when I started my career, the academic centers were doing very little uh, cardiac surgery. So um, I was hired by the group that trained me, and um, and um, had a had a really positive experience there, and was minding my own business when 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 Jim Goodnight uh, asked me to come take a look at at the job here. I was not looking for a job, but um, but I would have to say that in the last 15 years, um, of being 17 years now of being here, that for the for the near and intermediate intermediate future, I think that academic uh, practice is probably as good a place to be as any, for a whole variety of reasons that we don't have time to go into, and that you're very well aware of, most of you. Uh, and I think. Large group practices like Kaiser and uh, those kind of settings are probably are going to be most supportive. Um, 
not that they won't exist in private practice, but um, I, I think that academic, um, I, I think academic medicine is probably the most fun to be uh, place, but I, I think there are private practice settings that, that are going to be very, very uh, interesting and, and rewarding as well. Uh, so I think everybody's got to pick their own path. Questions from the team? If, well, people are thinking, I would actually, since we do have a little bit of time, be interested in your um, experience with the UC uh, consortium, if you will. The, this is a new effort as part of UC Health, and cardiac has been one of the first areas that uh, got together with all of the other UCs to think about, I think, both issues of quality and cost. Um, so tell us a little bit about that. Okay, well, so... Uh, pictures are worth a thousand words. So um, I'll show you our involvement, and um, this is, you know, it's been interesting, it's been painful, uh, it's not been nearly as rewarding as I had hoped it to be, but I, I, I think there's still fertile ground there to be uh, tilled, and uh, it's, it's led to some pretty interesting observations. Um, so what we've been able to do is take all of our STS data that all the five institutions uh, have, the, the five UCs that have cardiac surgery programs, and blend that with the financial data um, for each individual uh, institution. So that took, I think, about two years to make that happen, as you can imagine. But, um, but we are at a point where we can take almost anything that we do in adult cardiac surgery that's in the STS database, which is not everything by any stretch of the imagination, but it's coronaries, valves, and, and valves and cabbages, so it's the bulk of the surgeries, um, in, in cardiac at least. Uh, and we've been able to apply the financial data to that, and um, I'm sure Dr. Wisner might have some comments as well. but. Uh, you get to see sort of um, where you are in space and time, not only from a quality standpoint, but comparing everybody's outcomes, which are very similar, actually, uh, but from a financial standpoint as well. I don't know if this is still working. Oh, yeah, here it is. But here you can see this mishmash here basically just shows the, what is this one? What does this say? I can't read it from here. I don't yeah. know if you're okay. UCLA. Contribution to margin, is that what it says? Yeah. yeah. Yes. I apologize. It's not, it's not good. But here it is for like all the all the programs. So you can see from 2013 to 2016, for the majority of work that's done in adult cardiac surgery, there's been a, an upward trend in contribution to margin. The different institutions bounce around. This is, we're the purple guys here. This is us, for some reason we're kind of on a straight trajectory, I don't know why. Everybody else is bouncing around. UCLA has the biggest contribution to margin but we're getting close according to these data. Um, here again, um, what does this say at the top of Mean ICU cost. So it's interesting to see what it costs you in ICU to do different things. Now, granted, a lot of this stuff depends on how your institution uh, delegates the cost and the, the bucket, so to speak, as to where they, where they look at the finances. So um, these are the, the mean ICU costs. Um, LA is across the street from Bel Air. I mean, UCLA is across the street from Bel Air, right? I mean, everything is going to be more expensive there, and the reimbursement is going to be better there. But, um, but here is uh, what does this one say? Respiratory therapy costs. Okay, so this is kind of interesting. So you look at um, you look at at respiratory therapy. And now these are not huge numbers, they're 1,500 bucks, but you can see there's a big disparity between UC Davis and the others by, you know, by a significant amount. So like, why is that? It provokes you to drill down on some of this stuff. Which one is this? This is radiology, right? Yeah, yeah so look at us. We're at 1,000 bucks a case for our radiology cost. And why? I had them drill down on this because we're getting CT scans on 70% of our patients. Why is that? Everybody else is getting CT scans on 20% of their patients. Well, that's pretty interesting, and I think pretty significant. So we're trying to figure that out. We don't think we're ordering them. 
Um, it looks like we'll blame it on the cardiologist. It's always easy to do. Uh, <laughs> it, but they do a lot of uh, coronary angiograms now. I mean, uh, CT coronary angios. Uh, just kind of as a screening thing. So a lot of those patients are getting CT scans. And I think we're fairly liberal as well on the surgical side with our CT scans to rule out aortic calcification because we have to manipulate the aorta. But nonetheless, we you know even though it's not a lot of money difference, it still is considerably different than everybody else's and it's causing us to take a, a better look at that. On the other hand, if you looked at, which one is this? Cabbage Labs. Okay, labs, look at UCLA. They're spending 3500 I mean, 3500 bucks on their labs pre-op, according to this. Now, again, it's buckets, right? So what's going where and what, but everybody else is. But it, what, it, what this kind of data does, of course, is it makes you drill down on what your own habits and practices are. And uh, I would say that, by and large, this is kind of the, the most pertinent stuff that, that we get, have gotten out of it to date. It's been a little, I see Kay Behan back there, who is our quality uh, nurse coordinator. And um, I think she and I share some of the same frustrations. You'd like to do more. It's just tough. Uh, it's tough. It was tough to get all the financial data blended. Uh, it's tough to get everybody on the same page. Um, I think ideally, and I'm sure down the road, and I don't know if Dave wants to comment on this, but down the road, all the UCs have to do this kind of thing. I mean, they're already doing it to varying levels. But I think every every product line probably ought to do it because there's meaningful uh, opportunity here for improvement in practice. Practice improvement. That's great. Thank you, Dr. Kurt. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Daz. That was a wonderful uh, overview of the, of the profession uh, as well as our our, our specialty here. So to getting back to the UC consortium, what, you know, when, when, when you look at that, I would imagine uh, um, there's almost a peer pressure when the data's out there in front of everyone, especially when you all are in your group and the leaders are in the group. Uh, have you noticed uh, perhaps that um, uh, leaders at some of the other institutions maybe changed the way they did things in order to affect some of those cost curves? Um, or uh, did you notice maybe a lot of defensiveness and explanation for these uh, results? Well, as you know, cardiac surgeons are not small ego people, so I wouldn't say defensiveness has been an issue at all. Um, and I think actually it's a, it's a very collegial group. It's a small group of people. Um, I don't know. Kay, how many are in the group total? Nurse corps, nurses? 25, 30? Okay, Tony. So uh, it's a pretty small group of people. We all get to know each other. We talk on the phone. We have a, conf a phone conference every two weeks, six o'clock in the morning, and uh, we talk about different topics. Um, so I, defensiveness has not been an issue, and I think everybody really has a positive attitude about it. They'd like to know how to do things better. A very good example, I think, um, was. Uh, you see San Diego was keeping everybody intubated after cabbage until the next morning. Um, and when we started this, and everybody else was getting them extubated within four to six hours. And so they just changed it overnight. They went, not overnight, but you know, over the next quarter they changed it, and now all their patients are getting extubated early. Conversely, they, because they do almost all of their cabbages off pump, they use a lot less blood than everybody else, so there's you know there's there's different ways to look at it uh, from a value standpoint, but uh, certainly you can have some pretty major impacts even in the current era with things as obvious as as uh, ventil ventilator management. So I, I wouldn't, but but the first part of your question uh, uh, took issue with whether or not. Uh, there was competitiveness, and you know, I, I wouldn't say so. I think it's been it's been a pretty low key, pretty experience. Um, I think everybody's finding their way. I, I would say though, we've been doing this for how long? Four years, okay. And, and I would have expected a lot more progress. I think a big part of that is focus. You know, we started out looking at some quality measures, right? And then we transformed that to looking at financial measures, 
and then we kind of transformed that looking at group contracting measures it's been too diffuse if we don't put the blinders on and and yeah got the financial data but focused on quality improvement issues in my opinion um, we'd be a lot further down the road and we have a lot more to show for it um, unfortunately we haven't done that for a variety of reasons it's an imperfect world. that's just great thank you so much Nihilus for all your time.